In this video, we're going to look at using the second derivative test to determine the nature of stationary points. So a couple of things to unpack there. First of all, what is a stationary point? Essentially, a stationary point is where the graph of a function changes direction, where the slope or the gradient changes direction. So for example, if you had a cubic function, which typically is a graph like this, it changes direction here and it changes direction here. So these are stationary points. In this case, it's a maximum turning point. And in this case, it's a minimum turning point. If you take a graph of, say, a parabola, which is a quadratic function, something like this, that's also where the graph changes direction. So that's, again, a minimum turning point, which, again, is a type of stationary point. You can also get a third type. So we've got maximum turning points, minimum turning points. You get a type called a point of inflection, where the graph is basically going up, and then it stops momentarily, like at this one point, and then it carries on up. Or it can go the other way, it could be a falling point of inflection where it's going down, it stops, and then it goes down again at something like this. So these are both examples of points of inflection. So essentially you've got three types then of stationary point, points of inflection, and then maximum turning points and minimum turning points. So when we come to find the stationary points of a function, we find them algebraically, but we only find their coordinates. We don't know what type they are, and we call the type of stationary point its nature. So what we're going to look at in this video is not only how to take these example functions and find their stationary points, but also how to determine whether those stationary points are points of inflection or maximum or minimum turning points. And there's a couple of ways you can achieve that uh, finding of the nature, and it's either by using a second derivative test or using what's called a nature table. Sometimes, in fact, you have to use both, and we'll see that as we work through the example. So essentially, we're just trying to figure out which of these scenarios here these functions are in. So the first thing we're going to do is to find the first derivative and then use that to find the stationary points. And that's because the key fact really in this topic is that if you're trying to find the stationary points, they occur where the derivative, the first derivative, is equal to zero. And that's because if you imagine moving around this curve, you could imagine that in this part of the curve that you can see actually the slope is positive, so it's going up the way to the right. And then it sort of shallows off a little and by the time you get to the stationary point, that movement, that gradient, that slope is going to zero. But that gradient, that slope is just the derivative. So the derivative has to be zero um, at the stationary points. Okay, derivative is zero at the stationary points. That's a key fact for this topic. And that's true for all of these. You can see this guy's sloping down, then it goes to zero, and then it's sloping up. This guy's going up, then it goes to zero, and then it continues sloping up. But in between all these changes of direction, you've got that stationary point. And that's why it's called a stationary point, because the, the gradient, the derivative, goes stationary to zero at that particular point. Okay, so let's look at our first example. This is a cubic function. Let's go ahead and take the derivative, the first derivative. So it's in a differentiable form, so we're good to go ahead using the power rule. So 3 times 1 third is uh, 1. So it's going to be 1x to the power of 2, taking 1 off the power. The derivative of minus x is minus 1, and the derivative of 2 just goes to 0. It's a constant, it goes to 0. So we're going to now use the fact that at the, at the stationary point, the derivative is 0. We're just going to take that derivative, so x squared minus 1, and we're going to set it equal to 0. If we can solve that equation, we will have found the x coordinates of the stationary points. This is a quadratic equation, and this is a difference of two squares. Um, type of uh, expression. So we're going to factorize that as a difference of two squares. So two brackets like this. So we need an x and an x and we need a plus one and a minus one. So if we go ahead and solve that equation we're going to get two solutions. x equals negative one and x equals uh, positive one. So we're concerned with uh, finding the nature of these stationary points. So the moment we just know that these are stationary points, we don't know what type, and we're going to try and discover what type in the rest of this um, uh, example. But we should probably go ahead and find our corresponding y coordinate. So we can do that by plugging these numbers back into the original function. Remember that f of x and y are sort of interchangeable. So we're using that uh, original function to find the corresponding y coordinates. So let's start maybe when x is 1. So when x is equal to 1, we get uh, f of x, or f of 1, I guess we could write it as, as 1 third times 1 cubed, well, that's just 1 third, minus 1 plus 2. So I've just put x, uh, 1s in for the x's. 
So one third minus one plus two is plus one. So that's gonna be one third. This is basically a little bit of side work and this is not our main focus. The one becomes a three over three and then we can write that as uh, one plus three is four over three. So that gives us a full coordinate, which I'll, I think I'll just put up here, uh, a full coordinate of one four over three. So our first stationary point is at the point one four over three. It's always a bit inconvenient when you've got fractions to deal with, but you just got to uh, deal with that I'm afraid. So the next one would be when x is equal to minus one. So we're gonna get f of uh, negative one. So minus one cubed is minus one. So that's this time gonna be a minus one third. Minus minus one is plus one. And then we've got the plus two on the end. So again, we're just gonna make this uh, number, which would be a three. Uh, I'll just write that actually, a three into an equivalent fraction. So a three um, as something over three is nine over three. So that three we're making into nine over three. So the final answer there is minus one plus nine, which is eight over three. So our second point then is minus one, eight over three. Okay, so those are our two stationary points. We've got the stationary points, we just don't know what type they are. That's what we're gonna use the second derivative test for. So we wanna basically take the derivative of our first derivative, and we're gonna notate that as f prime prime, so f dash dash, if you like, of x. And we're just using the normal differentiation rules for our second derivative. In fact, you can take subsequent higher order derivatives and you just keep using the normal rule. This is in the format to use the power rule. Just remember you're differentiating the first derivative. So we're differentiating this guy here to give us uh, just 2x because when you differentiate minus one, you get zero. So this is our second derivative. The second derivative test tells us to then take our two x coordinates from our stationary points and substitute those into the second derivative. So one at a time, we're gonna get f prime prime of minus one, which is gonna be two times minus one, which is minus two. And then we're gonna get f prime prime of one, which is two times one, which is positive two. So how does this help us? What do these numbers mean? Well, they've got various meanings, but in the context of what we care about here, the rules are basically like this. If your second derivative evaluated at some value, say a, comes out to be greater than zero, like this guy here, then that tells us we're dealing with a minimum turning point. So if it's positive, it's a minimum turning point, which seems contradictory. So this guy here then, because that is, uh, let, sorry, because that is greater than zero, that's gonna be a minimum turning point for that particular stationary point. The second rule says if your second derivative evaluated at some number is less than zero, then that is gonna be a maximum turning point. So that's like this uh, guy here, it's less than zero. So this guy is less than zero, so that tells us it's gonna be a maximum turning point. So notice that those seem contradictory. Negative, less than zero gives you a max. Positive, greater than zero gives you a min. The third scenario, which is possible, if the second derivative test evaluated, second derivative evaluated at some value equals zero, then basically the test fails and you cannot use the test to draw any conclusion. And that's when we need to use another method like a nature table, which I think we'll probably look at in the next example. So this tells us here then that we've got a maximum turning point at this coordinate here. So maximum turning point at minus one, eight over three. And we've got a minimum turning point at this guy here for this function, which is one, four over three. And if you were to sketch a graph or use a graph in utility for that function, you would basically see that reflected on the graph. In fact, the graph of this function goes a little like this. So the graph shows a uh, maximum turning point first and then a minimum turning point, which we can see here because this is the leftmost coordinate. That's this one here, maximum, and then this one here, the minimum. So that's a process we're gonna use again in our second example. Just notice that this function, first of all, is in a non-differentiable form. Uh, because of the bracket, so we need to multiply that bracket first. So that's gonna make it x to the power of four minus two x cubed. And then we can just go straight into the working. So we'll take our derivative. We've got y notation this time, so we're gonna use the dy dx form to represent the derivative. So just using the power rule, we get four x cubed minus six x squared like this. And we can just go ahead and set that to zero and solve to get our stationary points. Remember, this is just the first derivative and we're just solving at this point to get the coordinates of our stationary point, not to determine their type. 
uh, their nature, which we'll do later. So we can pull out a common factor here of 2x squared, and that's going to leave us 2x minus 3 inside the bracket like this. And then just go ahead and separate that. So 2x squared equals 0. That would give a solution of, um, I'll just put these here for space. So just taking this up here, we're going to get a solution of x equals 0. So 2x squared equals 0. Check that yourself, but that would come out to be x equals 0. This guy, 2x minus 3 equals 0, that would solve to give you x equals uh, 3 over 2. So those are our two x coordinates equivalent to the two x coordinates that we had over here. So again, we can sub those back in and see what the y coordinates are. So when x is equal to zero, we're gonna get y is equal to zero because it would just be zero four to the power of four minus two times zero cubed. So that's just gonna be zero. So that's quite convenient because that gives us then a point of zero, zero. That's our first stationary point for this function. Second one's gonna occur more tricky, this one where x is equal to three over two. So that's going to be um, giving us y equals, I'm going to use this form here, so that's um, x to the 4, yeah a little bit ugly this one, that's 3 over 2 to the power of 4 minus 2 times 3 over 2 cubed. So 3 to the power of 4 is 81, 2 to the power of 4 is 16, I mean this might be a calculator question, and then 3 cubed is 27 times 2 is 54 and then 2 to the power of 3 is 8, so I think it would come out like this. Again, this is not our main focus, it's just the awkward numeracy that's often in these questions. We can multiply this top and bottom by 2 to make an equivalent fraction in sixteenths, so that would be 108 over 16. So we've basically got 81 minus 108, so that's going to be negative 27 over 16. It's quite an awkward number there, so that gives us our second stationary point as having an x coordinate of 3 over 2 and a y coordinate of minus 27 over 16. Maybe just check my numeracy there, but I think it's I think it's close, if not correct. But our main focus again is on the second derivative. So when you're using the dy dx notation, the second derivative is notated uh, like this. So it's um, d2y over dx2. So that's just because if you take dy dx and put it like this, with the twos, what you would think would be more natural like this, it looks like dy dx squared, which we don't want to confuse it with. So we've moved this two in the middle just to separate out those notations. So we're taking the derivative of the first derivative again, just using the power rule. So this guy here would give us a 12x squared just multiplying by the power and reducing the power by 1. This would give us a 12x. And now we're just going to plug in our values. So when x is 0, so I'll just write that, when x is 0, there's no opportunity with this notation to plug the numbers inside the function notation because of the different notations, which is a little bit unfortunate. So we're just going to go ahead and plug this in here. So that would tell us that our second derivative is just going to be 0, right? Because 0 and 0 for both x's, so that's come out to be 0. So that's the scenario in which the test fails, and we need to have a backup plan. And the backup plan is something called a nature table, uh, which we'll look at in a moment. In fact, let's just deal with it now. So with a nature table, basically what we're going to do is we're going to draw a mini sketch of the graph. So if we just put our x values here, and we're going to put our uh, dy dx here, and then we're going to call this third row the slope. And essentially, we just want to use the gradient or the derivative to draw a mini sketch of the graph. So we're dealing here with the scenario where x is 3 over 2. So um, we're sorry, where x is 0. So we're just going to put a 0 here. We know that the derivative at the stationary point is 0. So this row here, this dy dx row, represents the derivative. So the derivative is 0 at the point 0, and we just want to choose values left and right of 0 because it's the left and the right parts of the point that tell you what type of point it is. For example, if this is a positive derivative, and then 0, and then positive, then it's a point of inflection. If it's positive, then 0, then, uh, sorry, if it's negative, then 0, then positive, then that's going to be a minimum. So it's not actually looking at the point itself that tells you what type, what nature it is, it's looking to the left and the right of it. So if we choose a value to the left of this point, like minus 1, and a value to the right, and then test the derivative there, then we'll basically know the shape of the graph. So we're looking at minus 1 in the first derivative, 
So it's going to be minus 1 cubed, which is minus 1 times 4, uh, minus 6. Um, so that's going to end up being a negative. So that's going to be like this. When you put a 1 in there, you're going to have 4 minus um, 6, which is also negative. So you get two negatives. That's basically the slope, the gradient at those points. So that tells us the slope will go down the way, going down to the right, because it's a negative gradient of minus 1. Then it goes 0 at that one point, the stationary point, and then it goes down again. So what is that? Well, essentially, if you turn this into like a stick diagram of the graph, a mini sketch, in reality, that would be you know a curve going more like this. But that is essentially one of these. It's a point of inflection. So that tells us that at the point 0, 0, so at 0, 0, we've got one of those points of inflection. Okay, so we had to use a backup plan there of this nature table. That's because the second derivative test fails where the value comes out to be zero. So we still need to test the other guy. So we're going to do the second derivative. Um, let me just make some space here. We're going to do the second derivative when x equals 3 over 2. So we're putting 3 over 2, which is our other stationary point, into the second derivative. So this time we need to do a little numeracy. So we're putting that into here. So we're going to get 12 times uh, 3 over 2. Remember, 3 over 2 is just 1 and a half, if you want to think of it like that, times 12 times 3 over 2. And again, these could be calculator questions. It just depends. Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. So 3, um, three squared is 9. 9 times uh, 12 is 108. And the denominator there would be 2 squared, uh, 4. And then we've got 12 times uh, 3 is 36, divided by 2 is 18. So it comes out like this. Now, you do technically need to carry on and work this out as a number. But the important thing is we can already see um, that's going to be uh, positive. And all we care about is positive, negative. In fact, this would be, um, what, 25, 27. So 27 minus 18, so that gives us a final value of uh, 9. Yeah, 9. So a final value of 9, which is positive. That's what we care about. So we're in this scenario here where the second derivative evaluated at 3 over 2 came out to be positive. So in this case, we're dealing with a minimum turning point. So the point there, which is 3 over 2 minus 27 over 16, that is a minimum turning point. So again, if you could see a graph of this function, you would see these, this information. So this here, and this here, and the actual points themselves reflected on the graph. So this information is telling us that roughly this graph must look something like this. So we've got a point at 0, 0, and we've got a point at 3 over 2 minus 27 over 16. Let's just say that's down there. We know that this one is a point of inflection going down the way, and this one's a minimum turning point. So the graph goes down. Then it has its little point of inflection bit here. Then it's got a minimum turning point and it goes back up. And notice that that two conclusions that we drew there are consistent. They allow you to draw a graph that works in the same way that this gave us a graph that worked. If that came out to be a maximum turning point, there's no way that could be the case. So they've got to work together and be consistent. So the things to take from this class are, first of all, what are stationary points? What are they? How are they defined? This is how they're defined here. The derivative is zero at the stationary points. These are the different types, maximum and minimum turning points, points of inflection. You can then use that fact to find stationary points like we've done here and here, but that doesn't tell you what type they are, what their nature is. And their nature is found either by using a nature table from the beginning, or we did it by using the second derivatives. In this case, the second derivative worked great. In this case, it didn't work for one of the points, it's zero, so we had to use the backup plan of a nature table. So that's how we use the second derivative to determine the nature of stationary points.